like to welcome you all and thank you all for attending the last lunchtime lecture of the season. Of course, we'll be back in September with a new program of monthly lectures. The Moravian Music Foundation is celebrating 60 years of service to Moravian music. And coincidentally, the Unitas Chorale, our performing ensemble in the Lehigh Valley, reaches 20 years this year. And Maramas Chorale, our performing ensemble in North Carolina, reaches 40 years this year. So it's nice the way all those anniversaries lined up. Both performed recently on April 24th for Moravian Music Sunday, a program by which we provide churches with resources such as music suggestions, special anthems, a special liturgy, bulletin insert, and statement to be read to encourage them to use Moravian music at least for one Sunday a year and to educate Moravian congregations about their musical heritage. We also encourage churches to find and use their own musicians and create and contribute new hymns and music of their own, a very Moravian thing to do. I am Eric Salzfedel on the staff of the foundation and I bring greetings also from its director, Reverend Dr. Nola Reed Knaus and assistant director Gwyneth Michael, who are today traveling back to the US having attended the 2016 Chortreffen, a Moravian choral festival in Königsfeld im Schwarzwald in Germany. The Moravian Music Foundation preserves, celebrates, and cultivates the musical life of the Moravians. Let's take a look at the foundation's past, its present, and its future in this, its 60th anniversary year. The Moravian Music Foundation is an independent, nonprofit, tax exempt corporation. The foundation's work encompasses the comprehensive discovery, assembly, preservation, cataloging, researching, editing, publishing, and performing of the North American Moravian heritage. You have heard a great deal in these lunch lectures and through all of the foundation's efforts about the early Moravian music focusing on the later 18th and early 19th centuries in the American settlements. Alice Caldwell refers to this as the golden age of American Moravian music, the period from 1750 to 1830, when Johann Friedrich Pater was so prolific, writing the first American chamber music right here in Salem, when Jeremiah Stinka wrote the first concerted Moravian anthem in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in 1766, when Christian Greger created his choral book, standardizing Moravian hymn tune repertoire in 1784. When David Tannenberg crafted numerous fine organs for Moravian and other churches. When the Moravians presented the American premiere of Haydn's creation in Bethlehem in 1811. In the middle of the 19th century, as the American Moravians became more American, more like their neighbors, much of this old style music fell out of favor. American Christians were hearing, introducing, and singing different songs and hymns, thanks to publishing and distribution by many other denominations. Our Irving Lowen's tune book collection contains hundreds of these booklets and hymnals. And of course, the German language was giving way to English. This actually led to a second golden age in the middle 19th century, which yielded music, for instance, by Francis Florentine Hagen, Edward Leinbach, the Van Fleck family, many names we're familiar with. Being Moravians, however, they did not throw away the music from the first golden age. They packed it away in boxes, envelopes, even a cracker barrel, and stored it. In the late 1800s, Reverend Hagen himself identified the treasure trove and asked for these to be edited and published. He did not succeed, but continued with his own compositions. Many years later, in the early part of this century, sorry, last century, the 20th century, uh, scholars began to again ask questions about this music. Early important cataloging work and editing was done in the 1930s by Hans David and Albert Rau. 
And there's a wonderful story about this project. Many of you have heard stories about Miss Adelaide, Dr. Adelaide Fries, the one-of-a-kind and well-respected archivist of the Southern Province. The story goes that Dr. Rao, having done a great deal of work at the Bethlehem Archives, knocked on the door at the Salem Archives one day, unannounced and unexpected. When Miss Adelaide opened the door, he said, I'm Albert Rao, and I'm here to catalog your music. To which Miss Adelaide calmly replied, I think not. <laughs> and closed the door on him. He went away, but later returned with proper introduction and by appointment. As cataloging and research efforts continued, the researchers found that not only was there a great deal of this music, but this music was good and needed to be heard. The first early American Moravian Music Festival was held in Bethlehem in 1950, conducted by Dr. Thor Johnson from Winston-Salem, son of a Moravian minister, graduate of Juilliard, and conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony. The success of that experience led to another festival in 1954 and another in 1955. Recognizing the amount of work involved simply in preparing music for these festivals, a group of clergy and laymen worked together to organize the Moravian Music Foundation in 1956 to do just that. Dr. Donald McCorkle was hired as the first director and served from 1956 to 1964. His doctoral dissertation was the most significant research work on American Moravian music done to that date and for many years afterwards. Dr. Ewald Nolte, director from 1964 to 1972, continued the good work and led during the first big cataloging project. His research interests included the works of J.S. Bach and J.C.F. Bach. Dr. Carl Kroger capably assumed the executive leadership from 72 to 1980. The Moravian Music Foundation was born in the euphoria surrounding the celebration of the 500th anniversary of the Moravian Church in 1957 and the years leading up to it. American Moravians were proud to be Moravian. People in Winston-Salem are still talking about the big love feast held at Memorial Coliseum in 1957, with some 8,000 people present. New churches were being founded, and other new ventures, including the Music Foundation and Old Salem Incorporated, were seen as worthwhile to preserve and interpret our proud historic heritage. History, the arts, education, and religion were valued by politicians and business leaders for quality of life and in shaping the desired free and fair society. Restorations of Bethabra and Salem and research into the Moravian heritage represented these values well. Industry was booming, cities were booming, nonprofits were booming, and the economy could support new cultural efforts in this post-World War II society. The rosy glow of the 1950s gave way, however, to the upheavals of the 1960s and 70s. With wars and rumors of wars, civil unrest, civil rights, various liberation movements, a dissatisfaction with things past and with things American, a mistrust of anyone over 30 years old, the general disapproval of high elitist art, the God is dead movement, criticism of anything having to do with the institutional church, and all of the concomitant unhappiness of those years. Through it all, Moravian Music Foundation stayed the course with some significant accomplishments. It moved out of its cramped headquarters in the basement of the Southern Province Archives building to a glorious and gracious home, the 1917 Frame House on Cascade Avenue, that was to serve as its headquarters for 37 years. It established contacts with various publishers and made its name known throughout the church music world. Many anthems were, pu were published, especially by H.W. Gray and Boozy and Hawks. The foundation worked with Columbia Records to produce those recordings we still talk about and listen to. 
It undertook the complete cataloging of its collections and was able to secure funding from national and regional sources for this 20-year project, resulting in three published catalogs and type scripts of several others, with a complete card catalog in Winston-Salem that has more complete information on, on the cards than in a standard music catalog. All in all, the Moravian Music Foundation continued to do its thing in this very difficult time. Looking back from here, it's truly a wonder that a small, church-related, nonprofit institution dedicated to scholarship, sacred music, and high art should ever have survived the 60s and 70s. This is due in large part to the dedicated leadership and excellent scholarship of directors McCorkle, Nolte, and Kroger. The later 1970s and 80s saw challenges in staff and board relationships and in the very nature and purchase, purpose of the organization. At the end of the 70s, the cataloging project was drawing to a close and work had begun on a massive project intended to result in a comprehensive history of Moravian music in America. A great deal of research was done and references to music were extracted from the congregational diaries resulting in literally thousands of index cards. The long-range goal was the production of a book, or more realistically, several volumes, which would detail the role of music among the Moravians in America. What had not been fully anticipated was the sheer volume of material which would be involved, nor the changing economic climate of the times. In hindsight, the project probably would have been unmanageable, especially as grant funding became harder and harder to get. What was once, what was once a foundation staff of seven, with four fully grant-funded positions, had shrunk to a staff of two, a director and a secretary. Those many boxes and file drawers of note cards were left for future generations of scholars to use, however it became appropriate. And yes, we refer to them from time to time still. During the 70s decade, the Moravian Music Foundation faced challenges common to small nonprofit organizations, specifically how to survive the passing of the founding generation. The foundation saw the loss of its incorporators, many of its founding trustees, and the, the most disruptive loss of all, the untimely death of Thor Johnson, who had conducted the first 11 Moravian music festivals, who had given Moravian music its entree into the classical music scene far beyond Bethlehem and Winston-Salem, including the performance of Moravian music at the opening concerts for the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He had served as an inspiration to us all in our growing realization that this music was really worth study and performance. In a few minutes, I'll tell you one more significant impact that Thor had on the foundation. <laughs> there were significant doubts as to the foundation's very survival. Without its early visionary leaders and its early pragmatic organizers and supporters, obviously some great changes were going to have to happen. These changes did happen, but some of them were not easy and took a number of years. Dr. Jim Boringer was director from 1980 to 84, and his tenure saw the addition of a great many volunteers to the foundation's life. He also oversaw the publication of the 200th anniversary facsimile edition of the Christian Gregor Choral Book of 1784. He did a biography on Francis Florentine Hagen entitled Morning Star, and several other books on Moravian music, and a number of wonderful anthem editions. He was succeeded in 1985 by Karoli Krippa, an extremely gifted composer, conductor, and music editor who had a marvelous talent for finding some absolutely wonderful gems in the archives that had not yet been edited. During his time, aided by assistant directors, Jim Bates and Daniel Cruz, a great many anthems were edited and translated, and a number of publications were produced that we rely upon today. I'm thinking especially of the paragraph biographies of Moravian composers and the biography of Johann Friedrich Pater. 
Dr. Kripa was success succeeded by Daniel Cruz as interim director in 1991. Alan Schultz came as director in 1992 with Nola Reed Knaus as director of research and programs. When Alan Schultz left in early 1994, Nola was hired as the director, a position she's held ever since. In the 25 years between 1975 and 2000, a great many things happened. The nature of the Board of Trustees matured into a functioning interprovincial board. Prior to the mid-1970s, the executive committee of the Board of Trustees consisted of Winston-Salem folks who met monthly in Mr. Lineback's office at Wachovia Bank. Thus, at the semi-annual meetings of the Board of Trustees, there was often little significant business to transact, resulting in the perception, and in fact the reality, that there were two classes of trustees, the Winston-Salem people and everybody else. By the mid-90s, this situation had changed, with an executive committee representing the geographical diversity of the whole board and meeting only as necessary by conference call. This leveled the playing field and over the years since then, every member of the board recognizes that he or she has an equal voice. In a small nonprofit where the founders and their families have a great deal of personal investment and ownership, conflict is often a fact. In its growing years of the 80s and 90s, the staff and board develop new relationships of trust and partnership based mm -hmm. upon clear guidelines and clarification of expectations between staff and board. Staff and board together began holding a series of long-range planning retreats. At the first one, held in October of 1994, the board and staff adopted that famous mission statement. And you'll see here, this is the first, this is the original mission statement here, and then maybe eight or ten years ago it was revised slightly. This is the newer one down below. And they set some long-range goals. Succeeding retreats allowed the board to rejoice in the goals which had been achieved and to discern a vision, vision for the foundation for the coming years. Staff and board are now working together rather than at odds in relationships of mutual respect and trust. In 1997, the MMF staff and a great group of volunteers undertook a big project which we named the good, the bad, and the unneeded to organize our own institutional records. Before that time, every closet, nook and cranny of the Cascade Avenue house was full of boxes of papers, much of it duplicated. It took them the better part of our summer's work to plow through the first 30 years of the foundation's history, and they ended up with 73 gray archival boxes. That still sounds like a lot, but that's a lot smaller than what they started with. And it was all organized so that we can now actually find minutes, audits, research papers, and pretty much anything we need to know about our institutional history. Thanks to Nola Canals, we've kept up those institutional archives, and they're now updated through the end of 2015. At the same long-range planning retreat in 1994, at which the board adopted the mission statement, retreat facilitator Gary Harkey started his first session with us by telling us to set big, hairy, audacious goals. They did that at that meeting, setting short-term goals of microfilming the entire archival music collection, starting a series of top quality recordings, building a new facility for our headquarters, and establishing a Bethlehem office so now both offices are aligned with the Moravian archives in the corresponding provinces. Within seven years, all of these goals were accomplished. We've continued to use those three big words, big, hairy, and audacious, to describe our goals. There's something about that phrase that has called out the best in our work and has encouraged staff, board, volunteers, scholars, and musicians to work as a big but remarkably effective team. Now in its 60th year, MMF has right size to four full-time continuing staff members. It might that show up better if we hit the, if we 
turn off the lights there. I think that'll, yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for, and I also added uh, Philip Dunnigan in here, of course, honorary, yeah. honorary staff member. Um, and we also have two full-time staff on our current digital catalog conversion project plus some part-time project staff as well. So we have others that are helping with that on an hourly basis. This cataloging project to convert the card catalog of all holdings to an online searchable database is ongoing and already proving its value. MMF's catalog, not the holdings themselves, lives in the cloud on WorldCat. And our particular set of records is called Gemeinkat. In March of 2016, with the completion of our own work and editing of the converted records of the Philharmonic Society of Bethlehem, MMF had achieved 49,376 records on WorldCat. This project was made possible by a bequest from Mrs. Louise Nippert of Cincinnati. This is that lasting impact of a musical personality like Thor Johnson that I mentioned earlier. Mrs. Nippert was a benefactor of the Cincinnati Symphony and a philanthropist with great capacity. She knew and worked with Thor. She remembered his love of Moravian music, and she remembered the Moravian Music Foundation in her will. Amazing as she passed on nearly 40 years after his passing, but she remembered. Her gift has established a major endowment that will support the mission and work of the foundation and many more of its projects for many years and it's supporting our catalog conversion project right now. All of us can have this type of impact through planned giving. The Gregor Society is a program which recognizes those who have remembered MMF in their wills or trusts. Simply, those who have informed the foundation of their intentions become Gregor Society members. Investing for the future is incalculably important for the foundation to continue its mission and work. The Moravian Music Foundation is governed by a board of trustees of whom 12 are appointed by the Moravian Church in America and its constituent bodies, and from 9 to 16 are elected by the board of trustees. We currently have a lively, healthy, active board of trustees with 21 individuals who think independently but act together. Our members come from Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Ohio, New York, and we're always working to add trustees from more different places. We have a banker, a musicology professor, a computer specialist, a choral conductor, a personnel manager, a few ministers, a couple of school administrators, business people, and a recording engineer. You get the idea. The board functions through a number of committees and the full board meets twice a year, alternating between North Carolina and Pennsylvania. The board members respect one another's expertise and experience. Each member has something to contribute and I think it's safe to say that each approaches the work of the foundation with passion. These meetings are anything but dull. You will hear us refer to our holdings the collections of which the foundation is custodian. Um, these collections are owned by the northern and southern provinces, by the Salem congregation, by the Bethlehem area Moravians, by Lidditz congregation, Lancaster congregation, and Dover congregation. But only 6% of the foundation's annual operating budget is supported by the provincial assessments through the northern and southern provinces together. The rest comes from private donations and grants, bequests, and earnings from endowments. The Moravian Music Foundation has some real strengths. We have a clear mission statement and a clear vision guiding the board's work for the next eight to ten years. One of the keys to a successful organization, as Nola says, is getting straight just what you're supposed to be about. Like the Moravian Church, the Moravian Music Foundation has a history to be proud of. 
We have accomplished great things, and knowing our own past gives us courage and energy to face the future. The Foundation is closely connected to the Moravian Church in America, in history and in ministry. We see that connection being strengthened in recent years in both provinces and beyond. The challenges facing the Foundation now are both institutional and programmatic. On the institutional side, where do we find the line between boldness and foolhardiness? How can we be fiscally responsible without being so careful that we miss opportunities for outreach? How do we invest our talents wisely so that they will multiply other talents rather than burying them in the ground? The Moravian Music Foundation is enjoying the growth of closer relationships throughout the worldwide unity. Like many aspects of Moravian life throughout all of our history, we benefit from close personal relationships that then serve to enhance our work. The first Moravian Music Conference held in Herrenhut in 1996 served to jumpstart these relationships. One of the outgrowths of the 2002 Unity Synod in Bethlehem was the birth of a new relationship between the Moravian Music Foundation here and the South African Brass Band Union. And two unity-wide brass festivals have already been held, as you can see, in South Africa and Germany. The third one is planned for here in Winston-Salem in the summer of 2018. How do we obtain the resources and staff and expertise that we need in order to sustain our level of activity and grow? In particular, the Bethlehem office we are so proud of consists of just one person. And while Sister Gwyneth Michael is certainly capable of doing a great deal, there's only one of her. And there is roughly twice as much music in the archival collections there as there is here in Winston-Salem. Thus, if there's enough work for one musicologist in Winston-Salem, there certainly ought to be enough work for at least two in Bethlehem. On the programmatic side, in dealing with sacred music and musicians, how do we speak to the current trends in sacred music? How do we serve congregations who are looking for good quality contemporary music as well as good quality older music? The publication of Sing to the Lord, a new song, a new Moravian songbook, is but one way we're trying to address the question. How do we develop a closer connectedness with Moravians and other church musicians who live at some distance from Bethlehem or Winston-Salem? Our staff is very small, and we just can't be out there in the congregations as much as we'd like to be. Our board has 21 members. I'm reminded of the influence wielded by one Jewish carpenter and a small group of disciples without email or a website. Our story is certainly not nearly as compelling as his, but our story is intertwined with his, so we find it hard to be discouraged simply by our small size. The Foundation edits and publishes choral anthems in the Moravian Star Anthem Series. There are over 50 now. And some of the old favorites that are out of print are being re-edited and republished by the Foundation. For other out-of-print music, MMF maintains a lending library open to anyone. The Foundation publishes and sells instrumental music for organ, chamber, chamber ensembles, and band, etc. The Foundation produces and sells recordings ranging from low brass chorales to brass music of the Civil War, ranging from the Wolf Easter Cantata to 19th century parlor music written by Moravian composers of Salem including women composers. The Foundation presents concerts and disseminates information about Moravian-related music events. The Foundation organizes and manages workshops, music weekends, and the Moravian Music Festivals. The next one will be here next summer, 2017, here in Salem and at Home Moravian Church. Also for our 60th anniversary this year, we are collecting 60 instruments out of use, donated by individuals to be sent into the mission field. Just a couple of weeks ago, nine instruments departed in a container for Sierra Leone. 
So what might be good dreams for our next 60 years? We could open our first international office to coordinate those growing international activities I mentioned earlier. We could create endowed positions with the help of a benefactor, a legacy, for the director and maybe three or four assistant directors in several different locations. We could work towards recording the collected vocal works of Johann Friedrich Pater and Johannes Herbst and other American Moravian composers. The world is digital now and the possibilities for impact have multiplied. We could be actively involved in helping congregations with speakers, bureaus, mentors, educators, both Moravian and other denominations, providing good quality music of various styles for their worship, education, and recreational activities. We could be working even more closely with Salem College, Moravian College, Moravian Theological Seminary to equip students with practical use of our Moravian music in research, performance, and worship. And while we have been given, giving graduates internships and completed projects for their resumes, we could integrate better with the professors and with the curriculum. We could be participating in a new era of scholarship in Moravian music with the study of Moravian music in America included in nearly every music school curriculum in America and beyond. We could be seeing, in fact, I think we are seeing, the beginning of a new era of Moravian music composition, a movement that should be encouraged and fueled by the support of the Moravian Music Foundation. So as you can see, the Moravian Music Foundation is still very much committed to big, hairy, audacious goals. And with the support and involvement of musicians and music lovers and patrons, we fully expect to achieve them. Thank you. <laughs>